California True Crime is a podcast that sometimes deals with heinous acts of violence towards other individuals. This podcast may not be suitable for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to another episode of California True Crime. Tonight is episode four. I am your host, Sean, and with me tonight is Jessica. How are you? I'm good. Good. This is the first time we've got to record together, so pretty exciting. Um, Tonight, we will be moving south. We've focused on Northern California so far, and we will be in Beverly Hills and Hollywood tonight. Tonight's case is about a woman named Ronnie Chasen, who was shot four times when driving home in 2010. So we'll start with uh, a little background on Ronnie. Ronnie was born on October 17, 1946. Her birth name was actually Veronica Cohen, and she was born in Kingston, New York. As a child, she did some pretty interesting things and had some interesting talents, and she won some series of Dunkin' Yo-Yo contests. Her main job through life was that of a publicist in Hollywood. So I wasn't really sure what a publicist was, because I get it mixed up with like producer or what is it called? Key grip. There's so many different names in Hollywood. And a publicist is a person who whose job is to generate and manage publicity for a company. In Ronnie's case, it seems she would push movies in Hollywood. Most top-level publicists work in private practice handling multiple clients. The term publicist was coined by Columbia law professor Francis Lieber. Um, It was to describe the public-like role of internationalists. Unlike agents or managers, publicists typically take a monthly fee for serving a client. Her first job as a publicist is when she started working for her brother, Larry Cohen, who was a film director. This was in 1973, and the first movie that she worked on was a black exploitation film, Hell Up in Harlem. Have you seen it? No, I haven't seen that one. Neither have I. She had some pretty um, big movies under her belt that she worked on, such as um, the movie Rush, Driving Miss Daisy, and The Hurt Locker, which Driving Miss Daisy and The Hurt Locker won Best Picture of the Year for the year they came out. You seen any of those? Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't either. I don't think so, no. Yeah. <laughs> maybe Driving Miss Daisy yeah, but back was, in the day. Yeah, and I think maybe The Hurt Locker, but I don't know. So obviously she was good at what she did, um, and in 1993, she was named Senior Vice President of of Publicity at Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. She also owned a PR company called Chasen & Company uh, that focused on artists who composed film music. I also read a lot of things that um, she was really important in the film industry and paved the way for a lot of these artists, actors, and people in the industry. It seemed like a lot of people really liked her, but the comments that they would make, she was a go-getter, she was rough, she was a businesswoman, I'm pretty sure. Which I think you'd have to be in this. I don't know anything about this kind of job, but right. you can't it, be really a wilting flower. Exactly. Now, with this case, like I said before, it takes place in two different places in LA. The first being Beverly Hills, so let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, Beverly Hills is part of the greater Los Angeles area. According to its Wikipedia page, Beverly Hills was incorporated in 1914 by a group of investors who were looking for oil but found water instead, which then eventually became a town. Uh, It's named Beverly Hills after Beverly Farms in Beverly, Massachusetts. I don't know why it's named that. I'm just assuming maybe the people that founded it came from Massachusetts or something like that, but that's what it it said. Beverly Hills was pretty much founded on racism, which a lot of the uh, other cities at this time were. Um, There were these uh, restricted covenants, which were more like a promise than a law, which prohibited non-whites from owning or renting in Beverly Hills unless they were employed as a servant 
by a white resident. This also applied to people who were Jewish. So I guess these covenants um, didn't sound great. They sounded pretty horrible. And from uh, something Charles told us a while ago when we were researching this, is that you can still find these covenants on the deeds. Yeah. And um, you have to get you have to pay to get them removed, which is just. It's kind of ridiculous. And it wasn't just Southern California. I think this was Lodi he was talking about. Yeah, I think all of California was yeah. kind of affected by these. In the 1940s, this was uh, fought for quite a long time, and these covenants were deemed unenforceable by the United States Supreme Court in 1948. Yeah, and even now, it's still a really segregated community. Uh, on their website, they have the census numbers for 2010, and it's still about 90% almost white. Oh, wow. Um, and the the other thing that's different in Beverly Hills is the income disparity. Mm-hmm. It uh, has the largest gap between the rich and the poor oh, in wow. all of California. I think this is um, in a lot of different places in California where you have a very poor community and a very rich community. I think this is all over the United States. But California, a lot of people might just see those vacation commercials of celebrities telling us, hey, come to California. And it's like... That it's just beaches and, you know, the the celebrities, but it's like a lot of other states and there's quite a few poor people and then the rich people and it's very separated. Yeah, definitely. And Beverly Hills is, if you, if you've ever been there, it's, it's money in that involved there. And another stat when I was looking up stuff um, that also bothered me was that during the drought that we just had or still in, I'm not really sure if it's over. Um, Beverly Hills used the most water out of all of California, and it's not like – where we live, it's farmlands, almonds, where they use a lot of water. Beverly Hills, I don't think they're growing anything except maybe golf registrations or whatever they're called, golf memberships. Another thing about Beverly Hills is that it's home to the famous zip code 90210 and also the overpriced shopping strip of Rodeo Drive. I went and visited my friend Laura one time, and she took me to Rodeo Drive, and we went into a so-called thrift store, or I guess there they're called vintage stores. And I'll never forget this because I found this one shirt, and I looked at it. It was a White Lion shirt, that old band from the 80s. Yeah. The sleeves were actually ripped off. So it was like a muscle shirt, but it used to not be. And the price tag was $72 for a ripped shirt of White Lion, who I can't even think of the song right now. But yeah, that, that's my one experience from uh, Rodeo Drive. A little pricey. Yes, uh, j- definitely for a t-shirt. <laughs> so on November 16th, 2010, Ronnie was heading home to Westwood in her black 2010 Mercedes-Benz E350 after a party she attended at the W Hollywood Hotel for the premiere of Burlesque. Now, Burlesque was a 2010 movie starring Cher and Christina Aguilera, and it is also another movie I have never seen. Also, if you would like to buy a Mercedes-Benz E350, it is roughly between $40,000 to $50,000 new. At approximately 12.28 a.m., from what we, can, what we can gather, Ronnie was shot four times through the vehicle's front passenger window. She was most likely stopped or coming to a stop in the left turn lane on Sunset Boulevard to head south onto Whittier Drive. Sunset Boulevard is a very long road, and this part was a residential area in Beverly Hills, which the houses are quite insane and roughly... Um, if you wanted to buy one, it's in between ten million and twenty five million dollars for a house. And it had a park on one side, right? Yeah. Over uh I think well, I mean, was that on Whittier? That was on I Whittier. So. Yeah. On Sunset it just looked like it was a, oh, okay. just a normal street. And then she was gonna turn left, but yeah, the 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 park was there. After being shot, she was either able to drive or drift about a quarter mile which her car then collided and knocked down a concrete pole, which deployed her airbag. I think that park was right around there where the uh, pole was. She was found minutes later by a couple driving by and then uh, by the Beverly Hills Police Department patrol officer who had been on there. He'd been on his way because um, of neighbors calling, saying that they had heard gunshots. 
According to the police report, when police arrived, her car door was open, but this was done by the people who stopped, and they said they were trying to help her. Officers found Ronnie slumped forward with blood dripping from her nose, a gurgling sound coming from her mouth, and her eyes were open, but she was not blinking. The police officer asked if she was okay and did not receive a response. The officer kept talking to her while trying to check for a pulse. He never received a response and could not find a pulse. Uh, He shined his flashlight into her eyes to see if there would be any response, but there was no dilation. And he said she, quote, seemed like she was staring out into space. She was transported to nearby Cedar sinais Medical Center and pronounced dead at 1.12 a.m. According to the autopsy report, the four bullets entered the right side of her body all towards the upper torso and the right area. Three bullets caused damage that she might have survived from if her medical attention was quick enough, but the fourth bullet was very damaging and struck her in the heart. A toxicology test found no signs of alcohol or drugs in her system. Her funeral was standing room only with over a thousand people attending and She was buried at Hillside Memorial Park in Culver City. And Hillside Memorial Cemetery is actually a Jewish cemetery. It's not the most famous cemetery in L.A., but it has a lot of famous people in it, um, including Lauren Green, who I love from Bonanza, watched with my dad, uh, Mo Howard of the Three Stooges, Leonard Nimoy, and Aaron Spelling. Um, And it also has a really big shrine uh, because Al Jolson is buried there. Mm-hmm. He was in the f- first, I think, movie that where they had talking okay. called The Jazz Singer. Um, he's no- He was known as the world's greatest entertainer. Did a lot of vaudeville and including blackface. Right. Um, and I guess that he was buried in a big marble sarcophagus that was uh, supposed to be like Napoleon's sarcophagus. Oh, so and, he, was, he was big time then. Yeah. I think they spent like $84,000 wow. on the whole memorial there. So this being kind of a high-profile case of someone in Hollywood, um, right away, many theories started um, coming about, and they didn't really have any clues or leads to start with. These theories seemed to be more like rumors than anything else. One of the theories was that her brother, Larry Cohen, who said, um, quote, I'm sure it was road rage. I'm sure it was some kind of random thing, end quote. The road rage part didn't seem to work because it was past midnight in a residential area. Usually there's no traffic at night in the first place unless it's happened farther away from like where they think it happened and the person just kept following them. So if the road rage happened where it's more congested and then they followed them there. Uh, Another one of these rumors was that Larry Cohen had racked up some ridiculous gambling debts of around a half a million dollars. This was some Hollywood movie type rumor, like, if you don't pay me, I'm going to start taking out your family kind of garbage. Uh, I couldn't find a source of where it started or if there was any actual facts why it was said. In the same interview that Cohen talked about the road rage, he was talking to a um, like newspaper or website called showbiz 411 he said quote i don't play poker i don't gamble my two daughters don't gamble someone writes something on the internet and it's everywhere whether it's true or not end quote people were also using the grouping of bullets like it was some professional hit which just added to that theory the other significant theory would be um once people heard about the details of the will at the time of her death ronnie's estate was worth 6.1 million dollars as I mentioned, Cohen had two daughters, and Ronnie Ronnie was married once for a short time, but she didn't have any kids. So in the will, which was written on June 10th, 1994, it was split up differently between her mother, who had already passed away um, earlier before she's dead, her brother, and Melissa Cohen, which was one of her nieces. Now her other niece, Jill Gatsby, did not receive that much. According to her will, it says, quote, I have intentionally and with full knowledge of the consequences omitted to provide for my niece, also known as Jill Gatsby, except for the gift of $10, end quote. So one niece gets millions and the others gets $10. Now, I think everyone was living just fine financially with this family, but I think it was more on the principle. 
I guess people uh, making up their ridiculous theories again uh, started thinking this was a revenge killing for only getting $10. It was later revealed that Ronnie's mom was dying of cancer, and she repeatedly asked Jill to visit her grandma and never did. So Ronnie was very close to her mom. Jill talks in, about it in interviews, and it she didn't seem to care about the will and was actually very upset that Ronnie had been murdered. So this is just all gossip. All gossip. It's not it's, coming from police. It's just no, twirling. These were like in days after. Nothing had been said yet. They they just kind of knew. There was like all these weird things. They found this like security picture, what looked like Ronnie in the same kind of car, but it was a different license plate. So they were trying to say that, oh, maybe it was – um a mistaken identity and someone else was supposed to be murdered in this car with a different license plate. There was just so many rumors that no one knew what was going on. On January 19th, 2011, a little over two months after Ronnie's death, the Beverly Hills Police Department had a press conference run by Police Chief David Snowden that the case was closed and they had found the man responsible for Ronnie's death. Snowden said that Harold Martin Smith, an unemployed felon who killed himself December 1st before police could question him, acted alone in the shooting of Ronnie Chasen. Snowden said that the final ballistics report confirmed the gun used in Smith's suicide and Chasen's murder were the same weapon. He also went on to say that the man is the man that shot her. There is no conspiracy. No one else was involved. I know a lot of people don't like to see it end like that. They'd rather have something more dramatic. But that's just the way it is. The facts are the facts. So he's pretty stern about how he said that. Yeah. It seemed like... Well, you know, I think in a small... We've seen this in several cases. All mm-hmm. of the kind of gossip that goes on in smaller communities. Well, just in communities. In Beverly Hills. Right. It's its own community. And maybe it makes people feel better to think there's some reason this happened. Yeah. Something I, you're not doing. Because the idea of someone just being murdered by some random person is really frightening for people. Yeah. He said it is believed that Smith used a bicycle to get to and from the scene of the crime. It's believed that um, he shot Chasen in an attempted robbery. There's no additional evidence to review, Snowden said. He said the case would be formally closed in about a week once the paperwork is completed. He said that the police had essentially considered the case solved at the time of the press conference. It seemed like a closed case, right? Yeah, like all they, wrapped up. Yeah, what they were saying. Well, even though the case is still closed to this day, it has not sat well with pretty much anyone except the Beverly Hills Police Department. So even towards the end of the police conference, uh, Detective Mike Publicker said at the time that the investigation was 60 to 70 percent complete. Then referred to his then um, Snowden went on referring to his uh, statement about the final ballistics report, saying that was a bad choice of words. What he meant to say that it was about seventy percent closed. So already, just in the press conference where they say this is done, yeah, it's already like there's already weird things. So oh, what does that even mean, really? Right, seventy percent. Yeah, closed. I I don't know because we'll get into the ballistics report because. I don't know how to really read it that well, but um, yeah, I have no, I don't know how you could put a percentage on some paper that already supposedly has results. So this is just one of the many things that just doesn't seem to add up. Um, So let's go back a little now and we'll get to know some of the things we just went over. So let's start with Harold Smith. When I first read that Harold Smith committed suicide, I, being a Twin Peaks fan, first thought of Harold Smith committing suicide with his three-prong gardening tool, rake, and hanging himself. But Harold Smith's kind of like a generic name. It's like the horoscope of names. (laughs) Um, Smith was an African-American man born in 1967 and at the time of the murder was unemployed or maybe he wasn't. I saw a lot of different things, but there was one thing that he was working. He lived on the third floor of the Harvey Apartments, which was located in Hollywood. Um, most people know Hollywood, but Jessica, do you know how Hollywood got its name? No, I okay. don't. I first looked this up on Wikipedia, and I didn't believe it. So I dug deeper, and I found a book called The Father of Hollywood by Galen Whit- 
Whitley Keith. She was the great-great-granddaughter of H.J. Whitley, who was called the father of Hollywood. Now, this was in his diary of him and his wife honeymooning in Los Angeles. They went up on to Lookout Mountain to look over the valley when they see a Chinese man with one horse pulling a wagon full of wood. The man got off of his horse and greeted them, and H.J. asked what he was doing. The man replied, quote, I up sunrise, old trees fall down, pick up wood, all time Hollywood, end quote. H.J. then declared, Hollywood, Hollywood. That's a far more interesting story than what I heard, which was that it was just stolen by a developer from a development in Ohio that was called Hollywood. Oh, kind of like Beverly Hills in Massachusetts? Yeah. Oh, okay. So now people think of Hollywood and they think of um, the Walk of Fame and celebrities. The times that I've spent in Hollywood are like in the main heart of Hollywood is like a pile of tourists. There was peddlers trying to sell you anything, everything, just like a pile of makeshift kiosks. And it was really dirty. There was garbage everywhere. There's a lot of other places I would rather visit before I would go to Hollywood, <laughs> just in case anyone's thinking about it. Um, I should note, this is my opinion. My, my wife used to live in Hollywood and she really loved it. So I think everyone has their own experiences. Back to the Harvey Apartments where he lived in Hollywood. The cost of the apartments there at the time were only $650 a month, which is very cheap considering prices in Los Angeles. The Harvey Apartments don't seem to be that bad of a place, but I couldn't find any pictures of it inside. There is a Facebook page, but there's just only one guy who seems to run it, and he posts a lot of inspirational news stories and a lot of very elegant Jesus pictures, like statues of stuff. There is also some giant murals on the back of the building of the Beatles, Elvis, and Marilyn Monroe. I mean, $650 a month isn't nothing, though. No, but I think just with the cost of living yeah. down there, it's, I mean, 650 you could probably, like where we live, you could probably get a, like a single bedroom house yeah. with a, a yard, maybe. I'm just curious how he pays for it. I found in another article, like I think it was Time Magazine that they did, that he was working at a bike shop. Smith had a criminal record that, what I can gather, started in New York in 1985 when he was convicted of burglary. In 1991, he moved to California where he was arrested for burglary again, then again in 1994, and arrested for other charges in 97. Up to this point, it did not seem like he had a history of violence. Then in 1998, he took a woman's purse on Doheny Boulevard in Beverly Hills, which is in the same vicinity as the uh, where Ronnie was murdered. And again, an attempted robbery where the woman resisted and he broke her jaw, and this was in West Hollywood. For this, he was sentenced to 11 years in prison and was released in 2007. He had some drug charges after that and then was a no-show for court and had a warrant for his arrest. So he actually hits her? Yeah. It's yeah. not just an accident. Yeah. And not an accident, but... Yeah, it could have been that he was, you know, committing a crime, so his adrenaline was up, yeah. so he kind of hit her too hard and broke her jaw. Broke but no job. matter what, he caused physical harm to this woman. From many articles, I can gather that his passion in life was bikes. Like I said, he worked at a bike shop. It was in Venice Beach, but that's still... I, I just don't know if he was employed or not. Um, he loved bikes, and he had many of them. Most of them were stolen, and he would keep them by a dumpster next door to his uh, the apartment building. He would ride all over Los Angeles from Burbank, which is about a ten mi is ten miles away from his apartment, and to Beverly Hills, which is six miles away. The police theory was that Harold rode to the corner of Sunset and Whittier and stashed his bike and himself behind some bushes. He waited until there was no traffic except one car that would stop for the red light. Now, for the locals, that light seemed to be a light that took forever to change. In an article I was reading, the author clocked it on a Saturday evening at 9.15 p.m. that it took over two minutes until it turned green, and on a Sunday afternoon it took one minute and 15 seconds. I, I don't know if that seems long or not, because you have to think of the whole duration of going around the lights. So it turns red, then you have to wait for cross traffic, the left turn signal. I don't know. Does it seem long to you? 
I'm not sure when you clock it like that. It's hard to tell, but I know we've all been at those lights that just... That take forever. Yeah. I need to start clocking lights that seem to take forever and see if it's um, like this at all. And then the ones that don't change, like she was there late at night. Right. And you're just sitting there and yeah, there's no cars. Know, or but... they might not have a sensor yeah. and you have to do the um, flasher high beams, yeah. which I don't even know if that actually works, but, you know. They believe he came out on foot when the light turned red, told Ronnie to give her her purse and money but she wouldn't he then shot her and uh and she pushed the gas pedal all the way making the turn and running into the light post harold then fled on his bike that's what the police said harold then fled on his bike on december 1st two weeks after the murder someone called the america's most wanted tip line saying that it was harold that had killed ronnie the call was convincing enough that the police went to the harvey apartments to talk to him When entering to talk to him, at 6 p.m., Harold was in the lobby and took his own life by shooting himself in the head with a thirty-eight revolver. The bullet entered the right temple, exited the left side of his head, bounced off the apartment mailboxes, and landed on the floor. At the time of the death, he was wearing a Hawaiian shirt, green jacket, blue blue pants, and white shoes with white socks. He also had flyers and papers with phone numbers on it for businesses as if he was looking or might have been looking for work. One interesting thing that was on him, he had two pairs of black gloves and one pair of white gloves. After some some searching, I found that um, he would always wear gloves. He would take them off to shake people's hands and then put them right back on. I don't know if it was a cleansiness kind of thing or he just never wanted to leave fingerprints anywhere. I don't know. People have their oddities right he also rode bikes you said a lot so maybe he just has a bunch of bike gloves oh yeah because he doesn't want his hands to get hurt if he's riding for a long time i didn't even think about it that way so with this tip that came in like i said it was uh they called into the america's most wanted tip line and gave information the tip came in from laramie beckay b-e-c-k-a-y so i think it's beckay he was the anonymous caller but and he stayed anonymous for several years He was the neighbor of Harold's at the Harvey Apartments on the third floor. His reasoning for finally saying who he was and not being anonymous anymore, he said, After six years, I felt forgotten and I wanted credit. Due to my assistance, the Ronnie Chasen case was solved and closed. He goes on to say about Harold that he was one of the politest, most sensitive individuals. Becke also said that Harold was always talking about suicide. He called the tip line and said that Harold had knocked on his door 90 minutes after the killing. Laramie says, uh, quote, he goes, have the police been here? Have there been anything on TV? He goes, we haven't had this conversation. The next morning at 11 a.m., he's knocking at my door saying, do you have a dollar that I can borrow? He says, I need to go get my bicycle. I say, "Where, where is it at? He says, it's in Beverly Hills. I was at a loss for words, I knew what this was. So going back to all this, he says that he was at his door 90 minutes after the killing. The police said that he fled on his bicycle. Right. So 90 minutes after, I, I don't want to, I'm not a bike rider. I'm not going to clock six miles. I mean, you could probably easily do 90 minutes, I guess. But if the cops say that he took his bike, But then what Laramie's saying about he needs to go get his bike. Yeah, I looked it up on on Google, just did directions, and it said on a bike it would take you about 41 minutes. Okay. So I mean, he bikes all the time, in theory. So, But walking would be about two hours. Yeah, or did he spend all his money on a taxi then? That's why he needs a dollar. Or the bus, maybe. Or the bus, yeah. Um, There is a bus line near there that I looked up, it goes back to the Harvey Apartments, which may be why he needs another dollar. Right. To get back. Okay. But I don't know. And it's just weird because this was, this whole call made them go, and then they're going off of what Laramie says, and Laramie's saying that he needs to go get his bike, but the police state that he took his bike. Well, and I'm a little confused. He says that he knocked on his door, and Laramie is saying he knew right away what this was. But this was happening at like midnight, right? Or after midnight? Yes, it so was it's already on the TV. I, I mean, if if they're calling morning, let's say they well it, the next morning at eleven a.m. Yeah, it would probably be so maybe. Yeah, it it could have just been like a 
not so detailed, just like woman shot in Beverly Hills. Yeah. So if he's already said all the things he said the night before about uh, how the cops went by here, uh, we didn't have this conversation, then he sees the news of something happening in Beverly Hills. Okay. I'm assuming because Beverly Hills hardly has any murders, it's probably big news. Everywhere. Yeah. You might remember it differently too. Right. Uh, Becky waited two weeks before calling in his tip. The reason why he said he he waited because Harold had two strikes and was African American. He said we didn't speak about the murder. He became super paranoid. He was losing it. He said, "If I'm not back by Thursday, take my things because I'll be resting in peace." This was a week after the murder. Six days after the murder, Harold was evicted from his apartment because of not being able to pay his rent. Laramie said that he let Harold store two boxes and a duffel bag with with him while he was homeless. While the police started searching through the first boxes of Harold in Laramie's apartment, the police officer said, quote from Laramie, holy fuck, there's four empty shell casings. People were a little skeptical of how reliable the story was that Becky told, um, like the like what we talked about, the 90 minutes. Um also, right after the death of Ronnie, Harold Matzner, he was the chairman of the Palm Springs Film Festival and a longtime client of Chase, Chasen's, put up a hundred thousand dollars reward for the arrest and prosecution of the murder. So it seemed that others that lived in the apartment also kind of said some of the same kind of stuff that Laramie said. Um, Terry and Brandon Gilpin said that Harold told them he was expecting a big pile of money to come in. Brandon then asked. Uh, what are you getting money for? And Harold said, the publicist on TV, I'm getting 10000 The publicist on TV, I did it, I did it. So I don't know if, I mean, it's, maybe it's a small apartment complex and Laramie really wanted that money. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just speculating. I'm not saying anything, but like with that story, it could, hypothetically, Laramie could have been saying, hey, tell these people this, so and I'll, I'll give you some of that hundred thousand dollars kind of thing well and it almost sounds like two different stories right i mean one he's getting paid to murder someone and the other it sounds like he's freaking out because this happened right and And, he didn't really expect it to and that probably that could just be the newspaper knowing all the rumors yeah with the professional hit and so they maybe took it out of context there so now let's talk about the gun a little bit more um after recovering the gun from harold the Beverly Hills Police Department sent it over to forensic labs for further testing. They wanted to see if the ballistic tests matched or were a match for the murder. They also did more and tried to retrieve the serial numbers. The serial numbers were sup- supposedly obliterated from what the police report says. They were able to somewhat figure out what the serial number was and traced it back to a to Cordova Shooting Center in Rancho Cordova which is close to seven hours away um, in Northern California, more by Dorothea Puente. They called and the dealer told them that he still has the gun at his business. They then went back and used a chemical to re- recover the serial number, that a different serial number that had also been obliterated on another part of the gun. This time they were able to recover the correct serial number and found it to pr- previously belong to the LAPD training division. Before retiring, an LAPD officer bought it from, a, from the training division. The gun had been stolen from his home safe when he had to be evacuated for a fire in 2007. So I don't know where he lived. Um, right. I mean, there's always... We, yeah, we have so many fires around <laughs> California. So that, that makes sense, you know, and then someone can break in. Not saying that it was Harold Smith that, no. that stole it, but... When he was told about the situation surrounding the gun, he said he didn't want it back. And um, once the case was closed, that for for the police to destroy it. Now to the ballistics that Snowden, Snowden said was the final ballistics, and the other detectives said they were seventy percent from the police report that dates December fourteenth, two thousand ten, which is six days after the press conference that he said this. The fired bullet jacket could have been fired from the Smith and Wesson revolver as they exhibited similar general rifling characteristics and some agreement of individual characteristics, but insufficient for an identification. 
It also says that the fired bullet core is consistent with a 38 revolver caliber ammunition and offers no comparison value. Now this is where I'm really confused and stared at this one sentence for about 30 minutes. In many articles, it talks about these things about the bull- the ballistics are inconclusive. And when you look at the actual police report, it does say these things. But one thing that it also says that I can't find anywhere written about is that the bullet and the bullet fragments that were recovered from Ronnie's autopsy were fired from the gun that Harold used to kill himself. I wrote to the Hollywood Reporter that this article that had the article and the police report to clarify, but they never wrote back. On their website, it does say they can't get back to everyone, but they do read everything. So you, I showed you the police report, and you looked at it, and yeah. it seems to say that the bullets came from the gun, right? Is We're not experts, so that's no, the hard part. it's confusing, because it, it does say in that section that it came from the gun. Right. And then you looked up more about how police, uh, the ballistics reports are read and written and everything? Yeah, that section bothered me, I think, because I just didn't expect it to be so it either did or it didn't. I'm used to kind of seeing science, when people do science, there's a percentage likelihood it came from the gun or it was similar in certain respects, but not in all. You know what I mean? Like, I don't don't know how this works. So I looked it up and I found that back, back at that time, that is what it would look like. They would just say it did or it didn't come from the gun. Um, but there so are really basic. Yeah. But there are a lot of uh, new techniques that are being developed um, so that you'll get a better idea of whether or not a bullet came from the gun. Definitely. Um, because no, I was reading this article that no scientific method has zero error rate. So you should be able to say like in DNA where things are expressed numerically, mm-hmm. a percentage likelihood that this came from a person or that person. The same thing would hopefully eventually happen with this kind of... So it seems like with science and technology, it's it's getting more clear of how ballistics are read and people will be able to just have a more conclusive result. Yeah, because despite, what I read was despite the fact that, um, that they'll present this as it definitely came from a gun and the ridging and all that stuff that you look at, that more than one gun can have very similar, if not the same type of um, fingerprint on oh, the bullet, okay. especially if they were the same kind of gun or um, created consecutively, I mm-hmm. guess. So right after another, they'll have very similar ridging. And Okay. We'll put um, both the article and the police report up on California True Crime so you can look at it yourself. Now, even with or without this info, it doesn't really make Harold the guilty person. It was two weeks later that he committed suicide and anyone could have given him the gun. He could have bought it, found it. I mean, it, it is convincing that someone called in to say that he had had did it and uh, killed himself with the same gun, but it, it resonates doubt. Um, also, in another article, um, it says that the bullet fragments should not have been stored all in one envelope, but in a separate envelope to keep it from being contaminated. Because on the police report, it just has an envelope and it says bullet fragments. So it doesn't have individual envelopes that they were stored in. The ballistics weren't the only thing that people had to say about the Beverly Hills Police Department handling this case. Um, Other things that seem somewhat of a poor investigation was that of fingerprints. The police supposedly dusted for prints on the driver's side door and not the passenger side door where the gun was fired from. Some people were asked about the case and their thoughts. One of these people was Merle Stebbins, a California-based police science institute instructor and a former police investigator who specialized in crime scene processing and had 45 years of homicide experience. So he's got a lot of stuff under his belt. His choice words were, this is a fucking homicide, guys. This isn't a little shoplifting. This has to have all of your undivided attention. Uh, T.T. Williams Jr., a retired LAPD uh, homicide detective, also said, I mean, Beverly Hills, give me a break. You see a black man supposedly on a bike in the middle of the night he'd be stopped 15 times he would have stood out like a sore thumb just going back to everything of the history of beverly hills yeah that makes sense yeah so eight months after her death the beverly hills police department said that the case was closed after all the evidence had been thoroughly checked they had stuck to their story that harold smith was the sole killer 
and that it was a horrible random act of violence. Now, with Laramie, who called in the tip right after the death of Ronnie, we talked about um, Matziner put up the $100,000 reward for catching the killer. This uh, supposedly went up to $125,000 after another person put up another $25,000. Becke was never paid out and sued both Matziner and the other person. The other person... um, said that his reward money was totally false since all he did was call some friends saying he would like to put up some money, but then learn that the film festival already put up the money for the reward. And then Matzner said that he would not pay because uh, the reward money was for the arrest and the conviction of who did this. But since Harold committed suicide, he wasn't going to pay. Eventually, it was settled out of court, and Becke received an undisclosed amount of money where he went and bought a limited edition 2011 bright green manual transmission Camaro, in which he takes many pictures of and shares it on his Facebook page. He goes on to say, I had to use the money within a year or else I'd lose my disability and supplement benefits. Um, I, in some of the articles, it talked about Laramie Becke, a punk rock musician with disabilities. It never really said so. Okay. But that goes with, I mean, if I was to get on disability, do I need to go buy a Camaro? So I, I don't think that's how that works. I think any money you get just in general counts as something you have to at least tell the IRS about. Right. But I think disability takes past years of your work. Well, he, I don't know how much it would. But he still owns the it car. Now. It's yeah, still I mean, his I property. So. I, he'd still have to pay taxes on whatever. It would count as income, I think. Right. Um, he also says, I see a psychiatrist to this day. Tipping isn't making one phone call and getting money. Every day I think I'm getting into my car because a lovely lady died. I have PTSD from this case. LA combat, not war combat. For the people um, who said that he got paid $10,000, like that he was, it was supposedly a hit, like he was saying, I did the publicist on TV. Um, This was later recanted by Becke. Smith was part of a hit and run, and he was on his bike and a car hit him, and it was a hit and run. And he supposedly was to receive $15,000, and he only got $5,000 after lawyer fees and other fees. It should be noted that in the police report, Detective Eric Ion said, quote, There has been no evidence to directly place Smith at the scene of the murder, but said there is a substantial amount of circumstantial evidence which implicates him. I'm just wondering if they, they just closed the case with all this circumstantial evidence because they just felt like, is it? the right word scapegoat for Harold Smith, like the easy way out. They did say they spent approximately 10,000 man hours on this case, which technically makes them experts. There was like these emails of all of Ronnie Chasen's emails, just tons and tons, and nothing was significant, they said, through the emails. So they spent a lot of time on that. But I just like, I don't know. They're circumstantial, yes, but he was never placed at the scene, which is just weird. Other than the people t- saying what they, he said to them and the gun, which, I, you know, I have problems with the, the bullet science, I guess. Yeah. Um, I'm not really sure what other circumstantial evidence there is other right. than this guy who says he said this. And like you said, they can't place him there. I, and we don't know anything about him. I mean, I know that they put out a lot of documents to, I think, a, a man who's doing a documentary. Oh, yeah. But I don't think they gave him all the documents, so maybe there's things we don't we haven't seen. Right, and that's like another thing with the police report. the The one you'll look at, it's a I think it's 120 pages. Mm-hmm. the The problem is, is that a lot of articles say that it was 200 pages, and that's 80 pages I can't find. So I don't right. know if it they just felt like it wasn't important. Even in the 120 pages, there's just like six pages in a row that are fully redacted that you can't see anything. So. I don't know. There's a lot of weirdness. I mean, it's closed. I'm not I'm not trying to I'm not of trying course. to re-get it open yeah. or anything like that. It's just it's a weird case because just so much circumstantial and to me it it feels like it's a stretch of circumstantial evidence. Right. You kind of wonder if this went to trial how right. well it would actually do. Yeah. I never I never thought of it that way. Yeah. I I if I was the jury, I'd be like, "Eh, I don't know." Yeah. But I'm I'm pretty much like even if the, I would be like, eh, 
<laughs> no yeah. matter what. So, <laughs> well, thank you, Jessica, for this episode. Um, we hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, you can always ask us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, which is at Cali True Crime. You can see photos and, like I said, the police report and everything on CaliforniaTrueCrime.com. Subscribe to our podcast if you like it, whatever platform you use. Also, reviews are fantastic and uh, ratings. We also have a Patreon page that you can get to from CaliforniaTrueCrime.com. Any support is appreciated. Uh, again, thank you, Jessica. We also like to thank our quality control manager, Melanie Duncan. We would also like to thank our ballistics expert, Ben, for the help on this episode. California True Crime is a production of Way Grimace.